Hello, hello, hello. I'm Dasha Jennison, the Red Rock Pastel Society of Nevada. Hello, Jimmy, how are you? And today we are meeting with uh, Tara Will. So she's gonna join in a couple of minutes. And thank you for watching us live and thank you to everyone who is going to watch us in a replay. Uh, we created this series of Instagram live videos uh, during pandemic and right now we're continuing to meet with artists whom we cannot see in person. Hello Robert. Pizza pasta I guess. And here is Tara. Hello. Hey. Hi. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing fantastic, thank you for asking. Let me turn this around a little bit. How is everybody? I can't Everybody's hear you Everybody's waiting at this. Okay. Yeah. Well, hello. Hello, so you're going to be from your studio. I am, yes, my very messy messy studio. I don't know if you can see. Ah, probably not. Here, let me take this off real quick. I was trying to clean this morning, but it wasn't really super effective. I find when I clean, I just make a bigger mess. But this is my studio. So that's it. Well, I love seeing your studio during your lives, when you go live. And I remember you post uh, how many amazing pastels do you have? And uh, your box <laughs> is so fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I feel like every pastelist knows that that's kind of an addiction, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. Have... More and more and more. Exactly. Uh, may I ask, what are your favorites? Yes, I... Um... I really love Henry Roche pastels. Um, they're from France. I love Terry Ludwig, who's um, over in Colorado. I love Diane Townsend and uh, Unison pastels. And those are, I would say, the primary ones that I use. I have others that over the years I've kind of gotten sets of things and um, they're kind of sprinkled into boxes. I would say I'm probably not very traditional in how I keep my box. It's pretty messy. <laughs> and um, I do a lot of plein air work. So I ended up finding a, a style of box that works best for, for me and traveling and the type of easel that I use and all of that kind of stuff, so. And which one is that? Uh... I actually use a Gloucester easel, which is, um, it's a wooden easel. Hold on one second. I'll take you out of here. It's a, let me see if I can turn myself around here. Okay, so it's a wooden easel. I'm going to show it to you first. It's just a wooden easel that you set up. Um, pretty easy setup. It's nice because it's light and it's versatile and you can work very large outside, which is, um, hard to find with some of the, I find with the pastel boxes that it's quite challenging to um, work any larger than probably like a 16 by 20 size. So this, I've done things up to a four foot square pastel outside with this setup. So it's pretty good for large things outside. Wow, that's, that's uh, very interesting. We don't need to look it up, but it's, uh, I'm using just the, uh, a regular um, Hellman box and yeah. the expansion what they sell, but I do work smaller outside. So, uh, sure. what, what's it like? What's your inspiration when you head out for plein air? I see. I love your sunflower work, but what inspire you when you go out? How do you pick location? Um, honestly, I would say it's um, less about a specific subject and more about just kind of what speaks to you in the moment. Um, I would say uh, light has a big role in that because there are so many things that when they're affected by light or um, 
the light moves across them or whatever, you can kind of see something in a new way. So really a lot of times it's just what strikes me. It could be something really simple like an alleyway or um, I don't know, like just very simple things that wouldn't necessarily seem like they're compositions that you'd want or even paintings that you'd want something of. Um, there was a time I was in Florida and I was driving around looking for a spot and I pulled in and there was this kind of mid-century looking um, era hotel with a big hedge in front of it and totally not at all what you would expect to want to paint. And um, I pulled in there and I could just feel like David Hockney vibes in there, that very modern kind of like linear graphic feel. Um, so you never know what's going to strike you and kind of be something that speaks to you in that moment. So. Thank you for sharing. And uh, what can you say biggest difference between plein air and studio work for you? Like how different is it? Um, for me, it's very different. I am very inspired by, um, by seeing new places and, um, how the light changes in different locales. I mean, it's very different painting up north in um, Cape Ann area than it is to painting. I'm in Maryland. Um, so in Maryland versus out west in California, because I get I've been lucky enough to travel out there to paint. Um, so every place that you go, you kind of um, get to experience a different, not only landscape, but a sense of light and space and have that experience. And in the studio, you're very comfortable and you're kind of very, um, what's the right word? <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. You have everything that you need. So there's no, um, I don't know, I like the challenge of being outside and um, you're kind of, if you don't have a color, you can't go to another box, you can't change the weather sometimes you have to hurry up if a storm's coming or seal up early um and usually when i work plein air i don't ever go back over it again it's like once it's done it's done um and that's just the nature of kind of trying to capture the essence of something outside so i'm not trying to do a studio painting outside i'm trying to just capture that kind of that moment outside environment and in the studio in, i'm sorry environment at this moment like your surroundings at this uh, exact moment absolutely and so for me i feel like you learn a lot faster outside um you're kind of forced to deal with whatever environmental or um lack of supplies or you know you're just you're kind of pushed to your limits a little bit more outside so you i think you grow and learn a little quicker outside personally um, and I'm okay in the studio too. I just, when I'm in the studio, I usually work from images of, you know, photos of things that I've taken because I think it's very important to work from your own images and things that you've experienced and can connect with. Um, and so I just kind of start to get tired of looking at photographs. I like being outside, but that's just a personal preference. And, you know, some people are very, um, very meticulous about how they work and they like, structure and they like the the i don't know not like a rigidness but like a, a structure to it that i prefer kind of the wildness of being on the fly and like figuring it out in in the field so that's kind of i think evident in the work maybe thank you for sharing and how did you sure. start uh, the pastel how did you? I actually am um, a mother of four, and I had a set of twins um, and desperately needed to get out of the house. So I took a class at the community college. Um, the twins are eight years old now, so I took it about eight years ago. And um, the teacher did a really good job. She didn't really go over... Um, like color or design, that kind of stuff. But she did a really good job with the technical application of pastels. So she showed us, you know, the variety of um, different types of pastels, the soft, you know, which ones are, which companies and brands have softer pastels, which ones have harder pastels, um, kind of 
layering those, which I don't really layer so much now, but that was a good kind of learning process. She um, did a good job showing us different types of papers and kind of just the very technical aspects of how to, use, how to physically use the pastels. Um, and that was at the local community college here in town. Um, and then I just fell in love with the medium. I think it's very intuitive for me and for a lot of people because it just kind of, you respond to it. There's no um, extension of brush to kind of separate you from the medium. You're it's just very tactile and versatile and immediate. So it's just a good, to me, I think it's a great medium to use for a variety of reasons. Well, thank you for sharing. We were blown away. So uh, comments below say Anna from San Diego is saying, uh, for kids, you look 18. So <laughs> I want this comment not to get away from your attention. So what is, I'm sorry, what was it? You look too young. That's what the <laughs> thing saying. Like, you look 18. Oh, well, thank you. Um, no, I, um, so I've been painting for about, well, I went, when in college, I studied art um, at a very small liberal arts school, um, and they didn't have a ton of classes, so I ended up double majoring in philosophy also. Um, so I, um, I, I think the philosophical end of how my brain works kind of informs some of the um, abstraction, maybe, and like kind of the attempt to capture that essence of, of a scene and kind of feel like you're in a space and relate to it in that way. So, yeah. So uh, you said abstraction, okay? And I could not look it up, where was it? But a couple of weeks ago, uh, it was story or a post what you've done. And you say, if I will be uh, very old, I will probably be crazy lazy, lady who does uh, uh, wild colors abstract work. Uh, and yes. I can totally relate because I see a lot of abstraction going on. You're not uh, about detail, you're more about mood feeling and stuff. So uh, you're moving towards abstraction. So can you please elaborate on that and where is it from and stuff? Sure. Um, I think abstraction is kind of very challenging. I think a lot of people try to do it, but they don't really, um, I, I don't know the right way to say it. I, th I, I just think that it's hard for a lot of people to kind of think in that more philosophical space as far as the artist producing the work. Um, and I think lots of people can respond to abstract work um, as well. And when I say abstract, I don't necessarily mean that there's any sense of a subject. So it could be totally non-objective, um, you know, color and form. Um, like I have one here in the studio. Turn you, turn you around for a second. Like, oh, there's a big light spot on there. Let me see if I can back up. But this one is an abstract one that I've done. And ignore that glare there. But you can, it's kind of neat in pastel. You can still get some textures in there, like some very thick spots and scratching and, and mark making and all of that. And um, so to me, I think, you know, it's kind of, um, boiling things down to their essence and really looking for the things that are important that kind of define a subject. Um, and that's kind of what I've been after, I think, as far as what I've been doing with my own work. Um, and then I think, you know, I, I love working plein air right now, but I'm sure that that's also something that will kind of um, phase in and out over time. And um, so I think, you know, maybe down the road in a studio setting, I'd be more into doing kind of wild abstract work. So I don't know if that makes any sense or not, but. I, it does. So it's a direction where you're moving. So art is not like a goal. Goal is not a single painting. It's kind of a journey. Uh, it and absolutely is. Yes, I totally agree with you. So we talked about your favorite pastels in the beginning, but uh -huh. what is your favorite surface to use? My favorite surface is um, Sennelier Le Carte. So 
That's pretty much the only paper I use at all ever. Um, it is just so, man, it's just the best paper. I feel like finding in, in any style that you paint, sorry, I'm gonna try and set my tripod up here for a second. Um, in any style that you paint, I think once you find a paper and the supplies and everything that responds the best way to how you work, um, it makes such a huge difference for the quality of work that you're able to produce. And I know that that's the same for any variety of mediums, finding a paper that you like or a, or a brush or a, um, or a, um, a surface or a paint, anything like that, because I think it totally does affect um, how, sorry, hang on one second. Hello, Corey. Hello, Juliana. Thank you for watching. And this is Dr. Jenison with Red Rock and the uh, visiting Paraville all the way in Maryland. Yes. All right. Let's see. There we are. Um, so, um, so I think once you find um, the supplies that really best uh, accentuate your work, then I think it's... Uh, I think that's kind of a huge part of it. So I've found that Sonelli Le Carte, the way that I like to work um, in a more direct manner where I can apply the paint, um, the paint, the pastel um, in a single stroke. So I'm not into like blending or doing like the finger rubbing thing or anything like that. So the Le Carte paper takes that really well, um, that kind of more direct approach, so. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. So I was uh, wondering about La Carte paper and working in a plein air. Did you ever had any funny accidents? You know, La Carte does not like getting wet. Yes. <laughs> yes. So it is a little bit of a challenge. Um, if it's raining or drizzling, I'm pretty much like finding an antique shop or gallery to walk around in. Um, because I know that, that the medium can't really sustain that kind of weather, uh, you know, inflicting water on it is just not going to happen. So, um, so I don't use it. If, if I know it's going to rain, I just count that day or time out as space that I'm not going to be working in. Um, I think other mediums can handle it better or even other papers outside can handle it better. But I will say I've taken it on a kayak and plein air with Le Carte on a kayak and it wow. helped just That's fine. A, it's extreme painting, you know. Extreme like, painting, you know yeah. it cannot fall down. You, your kayak keeps turning and you just like wander as you're going in a circle on your kayak. But um, yeah, so I think um, I think to me that's the paper that I respond to the most and I'm hoping that it never goes away because it's my favorite and I do kind of hoard it. I get lots of it. That's smart. That's smart. <laughs> yeah. You like it hoarded. So that kind yeah. of answers, uh, you described your style as a direct way of applying pastel. That mm -hmm. kind of answers my next question. So you do not play with underpainting uh, techniques and Lacard doesn't allow that uh, pretty much. Yeah, Lacard doesn't really allow that. And it's just... Um, I prefer a more direct approach, I guess, to the application of it. Like I used to um, take surfaces and apply the gesso medium, you know, the brush stroke kind of thing. And to me, as my marks got a little bit more um, loud <laughs> or, you know what I mean? Like a little bit more uh, lively, um, the textures underneath just didn't work for keeping those marks nice and clean. Like I like that, that on the look heart paper, there's really no um, texture. I mean, it's textured and that it has that finish applied to it, but there's no additional texture as far as like the ridges of a brush mark when a brush is applied with the pumice gel on a, on a surface. Um, and so uh, to me, the style of painting that I do, um, I'm, not really interested in an underpainting because I kind of want to like jump in and like get to the meat yeah. potato, like really fast. So there's, it's, it's just kind of probably a, 
a personality thing to like what what interests you um, as far as what what that process is going to be. Yes, and Mark Macon, that's what kind of your uh, signature thing. So if you're walking into the gallery room, and I had the pleasure to walk in uh, on the last IAPS convention in the room, and you see bold Mark Macon, that's probably going to be a terrible painting. So <laughs> well, you have a recognizable, distinctive style. Why, well, thank you. I, I've had people ask about it. And I don't really, um, I think you develop it the more and more and more you paint. Um, I've painted a lot of really bad paintings that <laughs> I hope no one ever sees. Um, and then you start to, you're, you know, the, the volume of paintings that are successful versus failures starts to kind of balance, tip toward the other direction where most of what you're doing, you're happy doing. And I think a lot of that is taking the time with yourself and kind of pushing yourself to find that voice and find the way that you can respond best to that, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, a lot of people take, not that I'm knocking like taking lessons with people um, because I think it's really good to learn from other painters. But at the same time, I think sometimes people take so many workshops and so many lessons with so many different people and each person has found their way to to work in a way that works for them and so that's confusing i think to some people who haven't really found a voice yet and so i would encourage them to take the time and really push yourself to find that voice for yourself you know what i mean because i think otherwise it starts hearing all these little voices in your head well richard mckinley does it this way and doug dawson does it that way and you know what i mean it starts to get a little confusing yeah. and I, think, I think it's important for you to to find that voice yourself and to really buckle down and do the hard work that is required for you to get that voice to understand yourself thanks uh Thank you for sharing that, and that's absolutely true. Even like right now, we have a great group uh, gathered together to uh, take a Zoom workshop with Tony Lane. Yeah. And uh, that's one of the things he is actually saying. To any workshop you take, you need to put mileage to the ISO. And I think Marilla Baguetta says that that's kind of a common theme of advice. You do need to experience and learn, but for every workshop, you need to put your ISO mileage, so. That is a good way to say it. Yeah, I think it's really important that you find that um, balance between knowing kind of the rules and like how things work and like what's effective and, you know, having that kind of more traditional um, knowledge of, of what makes a painting a good painting or how, how materials will behave on certain in certain conditions um but i do think it's important to um from that from that space jump into a way that it works for you um so i think that's smart miles on the easel i like that and i love tony of course who doesn't love tony so yeah and Corey says practice 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 yeah i think um and that's another thing like that I think the plein air thing is really good for you outside because you're kind of forced to um, to not be so comfortable. Like it's very easy to fall into a, a routine and be very comfortable with having like, oh, well, I know I have another piece of paper if I mess up this one or, you know, that kind of thing. And in the field, it's like I hiked 12 miles to get to this spot and I have one sheet of paper and it's going to work kind of, you know what I mean? That, that kind of, um, I don't know. I think being in the field, you kind of learn a little bit quicker, personally. Uh, Joe says, it's only paper. Like, don't, <laughs> don't be afraid to mess it up. It's only paper. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I've gone through a lot of paper. So. Speaking about plein air, I took this screenshot of your Instagram. You just recently been featured in a plein air magazine. And there is an article about you there. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Yes. It was um, quite an honor to be in Plenary Magazine. I think um, 
I think generally pastels in plein air are not um, as well represented as it could be. Um, and I encourage anybody, I mean, any, any medium works outside really. Um, and pastels are certainly one that works really well outside because it's so um, immediate and you don't have to mix a color. You don't have to wait for anything to dry. Um, if you lose, if you use Le Carte paper, you do have to make sure you don't get it wet. But other and than that, so and, and it's kind of a bummer that we have to spend so much money on glass. But other than that, um, I think, you know, pastels are the perfect medium to have outside. And um, so in the plein air world, I'd say that most, most events that I go to, if, if I'm not the only pastelist, there's maybe one other pastelist. There just aren't a lot of us out there doing it. Um, unfortunately, and I would encourage anybody to to do that because I really do think it helps you grow quite a bit. No, uh, you cannot underestimate the value of a plein air work. Uh, it's as important as a studio work. Do you want to wait till it stops being 100 degrees outside here? Uh, in Las Vegas and uh, cannot wait to get out to yes. drink lots of water. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I'm not extreme plein air. It's like that's too much. It's like that little um, meme with the guy with the easel on like a little floaty and he's out in the ocean painting the, it's like some Italian scene or something. Extreme plein air. It's a, it's a new fad. Yeah, no, you know what Manet started it, right? Like, uh, he, <laughs> Manet started that trend. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> he uh, put uh, an article in a newspaper of, of uh, what he almost got, uh, drowned painting his uh, Northern Sea painting. And that's uh, become a success and he sold some of the paintings. So whatever you got to do. That's funny, yeah. I think, you know, I'm really grateful for all of the experiences I've had um, painting plein air because each one just like you kind of stick it in the tool belt and you learn something every time that you go out and you paint. And, um, you know, if it's if it's the landscape, if it's, you know, some kind of personal experience that you have um, while you're painting, like there are, I like listening to music when I paint. So there, I'll, I'll hear a song and I'll think of a painting like it's like they connect in your brain and so it could be you know um I just I think each each place that you paint outside informs informs you as an artist so thank you for thank sharing you. that was wonderful and uh, we're gonna keep it short and sweet today um sure. I love your sunflower paintings. Those are my favorite, but uh, Tara painted so many different subjects and uh, you guys can follow her Instagram. I get her in the stories and in the previous post. So make sure you follow Tara and she goes live quite a bit and showing her technique. So maybe next time you will show a couple of marks. That's very exciting to watch. So make sure guys you're following Tara Bill and Red Rock Pastel Society of Nevada. Uh, we're gonna keep bringing amazing artists to our live interviews and uh, maybe some exciting new Zoom events. Uh, thank you so much for watching us. Thank you, Tara, for being a wonderful guest. And uh, I wanna try to save this to Instagram TV so it will be available for replay on our page. Excellent, very good. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching. We have tons of hearts and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, see you all guys soon. Uh, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.